All right, well, thanks, thanks for having me here, guys. Uh, so my name is Will Grothwall. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a recent paper of mine, uh, which is a method called uh, Fjord, which is a new uh, invertible generative model that allows us to define this model with a much broader class of functions than in previous models of this type. And uh, so that's uh, hopefully will be made clear uh, throughout the talk. Um, if you have any questions, if something's not clear, um, please you know shout out and ask me because uh, this is there's a number of steps that we'll need to traverse to get to the real meat of this. So uh, if anything's unclear, uh, let me know. And I should say this is joint work with uh, Ricky Chen, Jesse Betancourt, Ilya Sutskever, and Dave Duvino from uh, the University of Toronto, the Vector Institute, and OpenAI. All right. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so there has, there's this class of generative models that have recently become very popular in the machine learning and the deep learning community. And they generate data with a very simple process where we first sample a latent variable z from a distribution p of z. And this is going to be some simple distribution that we know how to work with, so something like a Gaussian. And we're going to call this the base distribution. And then we have some parametric function f with parameters theta. And we're going to pass this sample through this function. And then its output, we're going to say, is x. And that's going to be our data. And so the, the goal here is that we want the values that come out of the function f to resemble our data set, whatever it may be, whether it be images or text or, or whatever. And uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to just do maximum likelihood learning on this. So we're going to optimize the parameters theta of this function such that the likelihood of our data set under this generative process or this model is as high as possible. And so what we can do is if this function f is bijective, then we can use the change of variables formula, which is you know, what you would see in any like, first year college uh, probability course. We can define, we can now compute the likelihood of any data point by taking that data point, passing it through the inverse function, so basically going from x to z. And then we compute the likelihood of the inverse of x under the base distribution, which we know, since we choose the base distribution, to be something we can work with easily, like a Gaussian. And then we have this other term here, which basically tells us how much the density of the base distribution is warped or changed by the function f. And so this, is, this quantity is equal to the negative log determinant of the Jacobian of this function. And uh, that is going to be the main thing that uh, we're going to focus on in this paper, because uh, naively, this is a very challenging quantity to compute, and um, <clears throat> and we're going to uh, kind of find a way to skirt around that. It's kind of be the, the main meat of the paper. But uh, to summarize the generative model, we basically sample data from this simple distribution, pass it through some parametric function that we're going to learn, and hopefully what we get on the outside is our data distribution, images, whatever we would like it to be. So there are some challenges with generative models of this flavor. Uh, mainly, we have some requirements on this function f that we're going to uh, learn here. The, the two big ones are that the function f has to be invertible for the change of variables to be defined. Uh, and the, like I said earlier, the log determinant of the Jacobian cannot be efficiently computed naively. Uh, that's going to really be cubic in the uh, dimensionality of the data. So that's not really going to scale gracefully to large, uh, dim high dimensional data and large data sets. So what's been done in previous models, that, uh, previous works that use this same generative process, is we're going to restrict the form of f such that we get these properties for free. And uh, there's been, I'd say, main, three main uh, works that, fall, uh, that came before ours that uh, that do this in different ways. And they are uh, nonlinear independent component estimation from Laurent Thin in 2014, which he then uh, improved upon with real MVP in 2016, which was then further improved upon uh, by, uh, with the GLOW model, which was uh, uh, released in uh, 2018. 
And so how this is done in real MVP is, uh, so we're going to define this transformation here. So we're going to take our input data, say it's x, and we're going to partition the dimensions or the features of x into two sets. So xA and xB. And then we're going to take xA and then pass that through some neural network. And it's going to output the parameters of an affine transformation, which we then apply to xB. So we're going to learn a trans we're going to output a transformation as a function of xA, and we're going to apply it to xB. So then this transformation then is we just pass xA through without changing it, and then we apply this affine transformation to xB. And so this is easily invertible because since we haven't changed xA, we can then use it to recompute those affine transformations and then invert that affine transformation because affine transformations are easily invertible. Similarly, the log determinant of the Jacobian has a very simple form where it's just the sum of the logs of the scales of the, uh, of the affine transformation. So we've found a nice way, uh, pun not intended, around, the, uh, around the, the main restrictions and requirements that we have to specify this model. So like I said, though, we're only transforming half of the dimensions at every step of this. So to model high dimensional, complex, you know, rich data sets well, what we have to do is we apply many of these transformations. We compose them together where we swap the permutations of the features. And uh, just for like a, a reference, uh, the state of the art model in this class uh, is GLOW. And on CIFAR 10, which is a uh, you know, popular image data set, this model has over 400 layers and about 100 million parameters, which if you compare it to a variational autoencoder or a GAN or similar generative models that perform comparably on this data set, they might have 1% or less, as many, less parameters and much less computation to sample from. Um, but uh, so that, that's kind of one of the main bottlenecks is that these models are very computationally intensive. Uh, but despite that, uh, we've seen really considerable progress on these models in recent years where we start with NICE in 2014 and then Real NVP in 2016 and then Glow in 2018. And these are all samples from a model trained on the exact same data set. And what we get with the Glow model now is something that is starting to resemble samples from a GAN. Uh, but the cool thing about these models is that we can exactly compute the likelihoods of our data and we can sample from them, which we cannot do with variational autoencoders or GANs. So they're a lot nicer and easier to work with, uh, like theoretically, uh, and don't have any of the known problems of GANs. So, um, so these models, like I said, require us to compose many transformations together. And we have those restrictions that I talked about. And so what we want to do in this work is be able to define the same type of generative model where we can use the change of variables and get exact likelihoods and efficient sampling. But we'd like to not have to make these restrictions of the function that we're going to use to transform the samples from our base distribution. And um, well, if we kind of take an alternative viewpoint on what these uh, functions that are transforming the samples are doing, then we can sort of look at it from a different way. And then an interesting solution kind of arises. So, we have all these multiple transformations that are being composed together. And we can view this as sort of like a discrete time dynamics process, where we start at time 0 and say that's the data. And then we get to our, our, our point at time 1 by applying our first transformation. And then we get to time 2 by applying the second transformation, and so on and so forth, until we've done all of our transformations. And so then when we think about how we'd compute the likelihood of a data point from this perspective. We take the data point, we transform it through, the, through time to the final point, then we compute the likelihood of that transformed point under the base distribution, and then we add the log determinants of the Jacobians of every transformation along the way. And so it's the same exact equation, but we're thinking of it in a little bit of a different way. So now, what if we think about replacing the discrete steps or the discrete hops that we take at time 0 and time 1 and time 2, and instead replace that with um, something that tells us sort of the instantaneous rate of change of this particle. Because it's sort of like going from uh, like a hidden Markov model to a linear dynamical system where we've now made time continuous. And so 
under sort of this perspective, uh, we have like a, a, a new type of generative model where we, or a new type of dynamics where we start at time zero is the data, and then instead of parameterize, instead of telling us how to discreetly jump from time zero to time one to time two, we instead have some function, say f, that tells us the time derivative of a dynamics process. So we can evaluate that function, and it'll tell us the rate of change of this particle. And this is now exactly an uh, ordinary differential equation's initial value problem. So what we can do is now just solve the initial value problem with initial values uh, equal to the data. And then we, our dynamics are given to us by this function f that we're going to parameterize. And then we can just integrate the time from, say, time 0 to time t. And then that's our final transformed point. So if we think about, so now if we have this continuous time uh, process transforming our samples from our base distribution, the uh, likelihood of points under this model changes. And so we still now have the log likelihood of the final transformed point under the base distribution. But now we've changed, uh, we've replaced the sum of the log determinants term. And we've replaced it with the integral of the trace of the Jacobian of the function that specifies the dynamics. And uh, so this is known as the instantaneous change of variables. And it was introduced in neural ODEs, um, which was a prior work from our lab, which um, was one of the uh, best paper award winners at uh, the NRIPS conference this year. So this has drawn a lot of attention to uh, these types of continuous time models. But so let's just. Uh, take a look here again at the different forms of the change of variables when we have a discrete time process telling us how to transform our samples versus when we have a continuous time process. And so they look similar. We compute the likelihood of the transformed point under the base distribution. But the change in the density is now given to us by this integral of the trace instead of the sum of the log determinants. And that's the key distinction that we're going to exploit in this work. Um, and so let's just take a second to talk about some computational considerations of the various quantities that we've been discussing. So uh, we're going to assume here that the function f is some neural network that maps Rn to Rn. And we're going to assume that uh, the time cost of evaluating a single forward pass is going to be O of n, which is reasonable if the internal architecture is fixed. Um, and that, that is how the time would change with respect to n. Um, <clears throat> so now if we think about the Jacobian matrix, uh, to compute that using, say, automatic differentiation tools, this is going to require O of n squared time, because we need to make like n calls to the like backwards operation in our automatic differentiation library to compute this Jacobian. Because automatic differentiation only likes to give us one row or one column of the Jacobian at a time. So if we wanted to compute this, uh, we would have to call it n times. So we don't want to do that. But now if we have the Jacobian, computing the log determinant of it is going to be cubic in the dimension. So uh, for an arbitrary function approximator, the Jacobian log determinant now is still bottlenecked by the computational cost of computing the log determinant. And if we look at the trace of the Jacobian, well, the trace is just the sum of the diagonal elements. So that's going to be linear to compute. Uh, so now when, we have, when we're trying to compute the trace of the Jacobian, uh, our bottleneck is actually the cost of computing the Jacobian. Uh, but what we do in this work, and one of our main contributions, is we are able to, we use uh, one or two tricks to, uh, to find a way to compute an efficient estimate of this quantity that we can get in O of n time. And those two tricks that we're going to use are vector Jacobian products and stochastic trace estimators. And so a vector Jacobian product is just um, noting that while it, it requires O of n squared time to compute the Jacobian in full, we can compute et dot the Jacobian for any vector e in O of n time. And that is just exactly like Vector Jacobian products are the key operation behind every automatic differentiation library. So, and that's this is a a, an, a computational uh, thing that they all exploit to do efficient backpropagation. So, 
for stochastic trace estimators, um, we note that uh, the fo we take a look at the following equality here, uh, where we have the trace of some matrix A, if it's square, is equal to the expectation of pre and post multiplying that matrix by a random vector. And if the random vector has mean zero and its covariance is equal to the identity matrix, then this expectation here holds. And so we can just derive a single sample Monte Carlo estimator from this expectation by just sampling, drawing one sample from PV, and then pre and post multiplying by A. And then, so this is now a, a, an, a Monte Carlo estimator for the trace of that matrix. So the matrix whose trace we want to know is the Jacobian. So we can just replace the Jacobian with A. And what we see here is, well, what do we have here? We have a vector Jacobian product. So we can now efficiently compute stochastic unbiased estimates of the trace of this, uh, of this Jacobian when we only have the functional form of f. And uh, so just to demonstrate, this is super easy to implement. You can do this in three lines of TensorFlow, where um, we have just our, we're computing our, our forward pass, getting our dz over df, uh, or that should be a t, actually. Um, and so we just draw e from a random normal distribution, because that has mean 0, covariance equal to the identity. And then we get et dot the Jacobian dot f by calling the gradients operation. And then we pass in as the grad y's or the top gradients this random vector e. So this is exactly what, like, um, like this is how you compute vector Jacobian products in TensorFlow. This is exactly what it's doing. And then we just post multiply by e. And then that is an estimator for the quantity that we care about. So now let's sort of put this back into the equation, so to say. And so here's the form of the likelihood of a data point x under this model. It's equal to log probability of the transform point plus the integral of the Jacobian trace. So now we replace the Jacobian trace with this expectation that we can use to derive the estimator. And then since an expectation is itself just an integral, we can swap the order of integration, put the expectation outside the integral, and now we can derive a single sample Monte Carlo estimator for the, uh, the likelihood of a data point under this model. And so we would compute this part, this part by first sampling a vector e, and then we would integrate et dot the Jacobian, and then post multiply by e again. And so the cool thing we've done here now is we can this is the objective for training a, a, a flow-based generative model. That's like what we call this class of generative models. Uh, but we can efficiently compute every quantity that we need to evaluate this model uh, when we place no restrictions on the functional form of this, uh, the, the function approximator that we're using to specify this model, uh, which is not true for any of the previous approaches that I talked about earlier. Uh, but yeah, so that is super cool, fine and dandy, but um, in some way what we've done is we've taken one source of complexity and swapped it out for another because now we don't have to put these restrictions on our functions, but we're dealing with these solutions to initial value problems, which it's not exactly clear uh, how we should compute the solutions. And then also um, the function f here is specified by a neural network, right? And neural networks like to be trained by gradient descent. So we need to get gradients of the output of the solution to an initial value problem with respect to the parameters of the function that define the dynamics of that ODE. So that's kind of uh, like super non-obvious. Um, and that's kind of the like a, a huge challenge that we really need to get over if we're going to do anything here. Thankfully. This is exactly what neural ODEs does. The whole, I mean, the, the main result of that paper is demonstrating that uh, if you have an objective of the form here where it's a scalar loss function that takes in the output to the, or the solution of an initial value problem, then they give an efficient way to compute the derivatives of the loss with respect to the parameters of the function that governs the dynamics. And uh, 
what you can do here is they show that you can uh, compute the forward dynamics using a numerical solver, but then you can also compute those gradients with uh, a similar numerical solver. And uh, so what they propose is something known as the adjoint sensitivity method. And um, so what you end up with is an algorithm that looks very much like standard backpropagation, where we have to do a forward computation step to basically compute, uh, you know, the, run the model forward, find out how wrong it is, and then we run the model backward to basically uh, accumulate the errors and assign credit to the various parts of the computation that created those errors. So uh, what they note is they can define this new quantity called the adjoint state of the ODE. And that basically is some sort of uh, measure of, it, of a, basically how the errors in the loss function accumulate throughout the integration of the dynamics. And the adjoint state here is itself governed by an ODE. And you can compute the adjoint state like this. So if you, so its derivative is defined by this equation, which is a function of itself and the uh, Jacobian of the function that governs the dynamics. And you can then, so what you can do is you can run your initial OD solver forward in time to compute its final values. And then you can use those final values to compute the initial values for the ODE that defines the adjoint. And then you can run a, so you can compute the forward pass with a numerical ODE solver. And then you can also compute the backward pass now with a different or the same numerical ODE solver. And uh, I would recommend you guys look further into uh, that paper, because they show that a lot of interesting quantities can also be derived through the adjoint state of the system, uh, one of those being the derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters of the dynamics, which itself has, is governed by this dynamics. Um, but in that paper, they show uh, if you're clever with how you set up your um, ODE, you can compute everything you need just by solving uh, the ODE once forward and then once backward. So it's, it looks very similar to standard backpropagation in a neural network. And uh, I will say in this work, we've gone ahead and done all of this and wrapped it up nice and tight in PyTorch. So uh, if you wanted to work with these neural ODEs uh, nowadays, you don't need to deal with any of this. So we've, we've done all that nonsense. Uh, so that's a good deal easier now. But uh, yeah, so let's uh, sort of put this all together and yeah? You have the video on the neural ODE paper. Cool, cool. Um, but yeah, so putting it all together and kind of summarizing what we did in this paper is uh, we define a generative model for data which has the following generative process. So we're going to sample a point uh, from a, our base distribution, which is in all of our experiments was a Gaussian. And then we also have a function f of z, which is going to output the time derivative of a continuous time dynamics process. Then we're going to solve the initial value problem, with the initial value being our sample from the base distribution. We're going to integrate that from time 0 to time 1. And we're going to say the output of that, the solution to that initial value problem, is our data. And <clears throat> so under this generative model, we can compute the likelihood of any point using the continuous version of the change of variables. And we are going to optimize uh, unbiased stochastic estimates of that likelihood, which we obtain from our stochastic trace estimators. And then we're going to compute the, we're going to optimize the parameters of our dynamics function using the adjoint sensitivity method introduced in the neural ODEs paper. And that sounds like a lot, but <laughs> um, what this gives us is really the first uh, invertible generative model, or the first model of this class that can be specified with, without restricting the architecture of the function approximators used, which uh, we will hopefully show in our results is a, is a fairly big deal. And uh, because we're not placing any restrictions on the function, uh, we've called this uh, model the freeform Jacobian of reversible dynamics, or the very forced acronym of uh, FJORD. Uh, so that's kind of the main conceptual nuggets in the paper.
Uh, and then uh, I have a bunch more stuff to talk about uh, how this can be applied, what we've applied it to, uh, and then some analysis on problems with the method and where it can go. But uh, this is a good time for a... Yeah, so